Thank you for joining the Simulation Tips and Tricks webinar. Uh, my name is Sean Bentley. Uh, in the past dozen years or so, I've picked up a lot of different tricks and techniques for how to model things in SOLIDWORKS Simulation, and I'm here today to share some of those with you. So some of the tips I'll be walking you through, some of the big ones anyway, it's going to follow, I'm going to follow through some of the typical steps in the simulation. First of all, we'll talk about setting up the template, um, material, fixtures, loads, connections, and then of course the mesh. So I'll give you a, a whole bunch of tips along the way in between these as well. And so these are going to be the big major points, and then there'll be some in-between smaller tips. Tip number one is to set up your simulation template. If you haven't already done this, please do it. Uh, it'll save you a, a bit of a headache of having to constantly read scientific notation from your charts. This is the factory default set of settings here on the left. And on the right, um, here you see I've already customized my simulation template so that it all my charts show up nice and clean, simple floating, single point floating numbers, units of maybe KSI or megapascals if you prefer uh, English or, or SI. So some of the ones that I commonly customize are shown here. So if you want to match any of these on your system, um, feel free. And I'll show a few of them and, and talk briefly about them. Now one of the big ones I'll show too uh, that I really like is this optimized for color blindness. You can kind of see the color chart scale. The default, the factory default looks kind of like this, whereas the optimized for color blindness. And as far as I know, I know I'm not colorblind, but I really can't tell the difference between this green here and that one there. And that makes up a pretty big chunk of the scale. So this will help clean up your color charts and even make them more presentable if you just go ahead and tweak this, this option as well as a batch of others. So how do you create, uh, how do you customize your simulation template? Well, it's easy. You load up your SOLIDWORKS and you go right to the simulation options. And right under the default options is where you can go to change your color chart, for example. And you see I've already changed a lot of mine to be optimized for color blindness. Another few options I recommend are these couple of checkboxes, general, and set the decimal places to four so that that way if you want to show thousandths of an inch or tens of thousandths, it won't convert to scientific notation for you. You might even bump this up to be a little higher. Now a few other customizations I showed in that slide as well that I think are really handy. Uh, of course, go under units, change this stress value. A lot of times it'll be in newtons per meter squared, which is tiny, or also in PSI, which is pretty small. You might change it to either KSI or MPA, whichever unit system you prefer. I'll be using a lot of English units in this presentation. A couple of the other customizations is change your mesh over to curvature based. Okay, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. It'll be tip number six. Or, um, and then uh, also in your results, turn on uh, saving uh, but save your results under a subfolder. That way you're not cluttering up your SOLIDWORKS document folder. Um, and then finally, one, one last one that uh, I customize is this uh, plot three. You know, you normally it'll, when you run a study, it'll show your stress, displacement, and strain. But for static studies, I don't look a lot at strain. But instead, I'll, I'll change it to elemental stress and look at energy norm errors. That'll be tip number seven. I'll take a look at that later on as well with you. So again, those, those uh, options summarize for you. Um, ones I commonly recommend and commonly change, all shown on this slide here. Should help clean up those plots, make it look a lot nicer right out of the gate. Step number two, we'll talk about uh, setting up your material. Now, how often is it that uh, you don't have all the material data that you need? When you run a static study, we require you to have these things that are in red. Elastic modulus, Poisson's ratio, mass density, yield strength, um, but do you really need all these properties? Let's say if I want to print off, 3D print something, and I don't know what, what exact properties I want to key in for that print, but I, want, I just want to test two different design variations to see which one's going to have more stress. So without even really getting into the fuss of assigning a precise material to them, I can just throw some sort of dummy material on both of them and run the same study, use the same kind of boundary condition here. In this case, I'm prescribing a downward displacement on this release. This is supposed to be like a release lever on a, uh, on a uh, COVID snorkel. If I push down on each one by one millimeter, you can see how much more stress I get with this geometry versus that geometry, independent of the material. So you can still, my main point here is you can still make design decisions without knowing all the precise material properties. We can kind of move our design more in this direction. Now, it's always better if you do have all the properties available to you, but a lot of times you may not. So sometimes we can, we can use this idea um, 
to still make des uh, clever design decisions. In the case of like materials, metals like steel, where there's a lot of material data available, even if you don't have the exact, if you're not sure what exact grade of steel you might be using, we can still uh, plug in some maybe dummy steel and run with that and make some quick design decisions based on that. If I take a look at a quick summary of the material database, you can kind of see what, uh, what the general properties for steel are going to be. In the case of the elastic modulus, one of the real key properties, um, you can see that most steels are going to be right around 200 gigapascals. Okay? And the variance there is pretty small, 190 up to 210. Poisson's ratio, another one of those required properties, also pretty small variance. So if we're creating a, just a dummy steel for now, we can just use a value like a rent in the ballpark of 0.3. Now yield strength, though, the strength of steel, that's the, that's the big variable. You can see this is pretty widespread. It goes from maybe 150 in our database all the way up to 900. And if you, you can give, even get higher strength steels, they're up in the 1,000 range. By the way, these units are in megapascals. And giga, these are SI units I'm using here. But uh, so what are we supposed to do about that? Well, uh, what we can do is we can create sort of a conservative dummy steel we can use for some of our tests, and then we can uh, run our studies with this dummy steel and still make some design decisions based on that. And what I'm going to show you is uh, I'm going to run a quick study with this dummy steel, I've called it. I'll create a custom material for that, and I'll compare it to a study where I run it with just a steel that's in our database called alloy steel. Now in this brief demonstration, I'll show you a few other little tips, creating custom materials, saving a favorite, copying the studies, even comparing the results as well. So be on the lookout for that stuff. So here I've got uh, just a simple block. I'll put it in simple tension just, show it to, just to show this concept here. I've got a study that's already set up partially, but it's, it's just missing the material right now. I just need to fill in that material data. If I go ahead and apply uh, some material, and here I'm not sure which material I want to use yet. So what I'll do is let me create a custom one that's just on the conservative end. I just know I, I know I want to use steel, but I'm not sure which grade yet. But I'll keep, create a copy of one of those steels and I'll paste it into my, uh, my custom materials library. This is where I have right access, the blue folders. You're able to change the materials in here. And we'll customize the properties to be on the low end on a lot of what, uh, what we saw in that, um, uh, based on that summary I showed you a moment ago. Some of these I'll make on that on the low end of that, the conservative end. I think the average density is somewhere around 80, 50 for a lot of our steel, so I'll just plug in that average. And then this yield strength, I'll bump that down to 100, and that way I'll get very conservative safety factors. Again, always better if you know exactly which grade you're using right in the get-go, but let's see how we can even use this steel. Change the name of it, maybe I'll just call it dummy steel for now, literally. And uh, let me add this to my favorites so that I can use it for further studies without having to open up the whole material database here. If I go to my favorites tab, you can see what's already on this tab. So some of these materials I might never use, like anything that's not a steel or aluminum. Okay, maybe I'll remove all that stuff, and then I'll add my dummy steel to this list. Maybe put it right in the top. Okay, so now I'll go ahead and close that material dialog. And here we can see if I ever want to assign my... That, that steel material again, you can see it right, it pops up right in my favorites list here. So it's really handy to speed up assigning those materials. Let me go ahead and run this study. Just use a default mesh. And you see I get a quick result. And uh, the, the result here, it's 10 KSI. If I customize this to go from 10 to, to 20, you can kind of tell the, the stress is pretty constant across here. It goes, goes up to 10 KSI on a simple bar. Now, uh, also we can make a copy of your studies down here if I right click on my dummy steel study. This is, of course is where it stores your studies. We can make a copy of it and maybe try out another steel. Let's try the alloy steel that's already in our database. I'll make a quick uh, change to uh, my material. Change it to alloy steel, another one that was in my custom folder, but we also have it right up here. You can also download these from MatWeb, some of these materials. I'll go ahead and run it this way with the alloy steel. And you see, I get the same stresses. Still 10, still 10 KSI. As a matter of fact, let's do a comparison. If I right click on my stress plot, I can use the compare results tool to compare between the couple of studies that I've run. And we can see how similar my just crude uh, steel does compared to the uh, alloy steel that's in the database. Here I'll tell it to compare stresses and displacements. 
and it puts them all side by side on my screen here and you can see across the top the the name of the study dummy steel here on the left and then my alloy steel on the right and the uh, actual results here they're pretty close you see the stresses are identical but my uh, my displacements are quite a bit different 0 0.004 well not too different though 0 0.004 versus 0 0.0039 they're all they're both in the ballpark of four thousandths of an inch so this this a lot of times just using just a crude uh, replica of a material is uh, it can get you close enough quickly without having to do a lot of research and then here if I ever do decide that uh, I want to use a higher strength steel well you can compare the 10 KSI that I have here to the to the new yield strength without even having to rerun the study and uh, you can decide what your safety factors are right now my safety factors are about 10 but if I use a yield strength of say 300 then my factor safety would be more close to 30 All right, so next next what I'd like to take a look at, tip number three, talk about some fixtures. So we're going to try out a fixture type called a, what I call a sliding hinge. I use this uh, very often in a lot of my studies. So and there's not actually a fixture called sliding hinge in SOLIDWORK simulation. It's just a special way to create a, a certain type of fixture, which I'll, I'll show you next. So what I have here is a simple fire extinguisher bracket. I didn't have to look too far to find an example where I could use this fixture type. This is actually, this is my office door right here and just peeked around the corner and so, yep, it's gonna be a, a perfect use case for this. Um, and the simple load case here, we have a fire extinguisher hanging on the end of it. It weighs about 9.8 pounds, about 10 pounds. And then we got the, uh, the bolts that are gonna bolt into the wall. And uh, let's, let's talk about how we're gonna fixture this thing. So in this brief demonstration, I'll show uh, creating a quick split line, uh, doing a quick copy of a plot, showing uh, plus or minus displacements, and uh, maybe a quick shortcut to the exaggeration scale, so a few extra little tricks in there. All right, so what I'm going to be doing with this fire extinguisher example is let's create a new study and show some different fixturing methods. Um, oh, yeah, and before I even do this, um, think about where I want to have that load as well. You remember how that, how that fire extinguisher rests on top of here? Okay, it's got this like circle wraps around. So there's like this region in here that it touches. So maybe let's talk about how I want to apply my load. Maybe something like this, perhaps initially. So if I want to apply my load to a little surface in there, I right now if I click on this, it grabs the whole face. But I just want a subsurface right here I can select. Uh, in order to create that subsurface, I've already drawn a sketch in here, and I can use this sketch to create a uh, quick split line. So if you've never used this tool, it's the, probably the hardest part of the split line tool is remembering where it's located. It's in kind of a weird spot. It's under insert curve, split line. Okay. So this, turbo, cur this tool will allow me to split this face up and do some subfaces. If I go ahead and use this tool on the face with this sketch, now I have some subfaces. Okay. And here's maybe where I want to put my force. So if I go ahead and create a study from this, And uh, I'll use that same dummy steel we used earlier. And we'll go ahead and uh, create, our, create our load first, I suppose. Let's get that out of the way, and then we'll talk about the fixturing. So my load in this case will be 9.8 pounds. And right now I'll apply it uniformly to the surface, but I do want you to think about that a bit. That'll be one of our next tips we'll talk about in a moment. Now for my fixtures, I'll go ahead and add a fixture and maybe I'm not too sure what I want to do here as far as constraining. Maybe I'll just fix these two faces because these interact with uh, the bolts. And maybe I'll just grab this whole face because I, I know this face interacts with the wall. So I'll start with this fixturing routine and see, how, see what kind of result we get. If I just go ahead and run the study, and I'm not going to talk much about the mesh here yet. We'll get to that later on. I'll just run it with a default mesh. The result I want to take a look at here is my displacements. So we got a displacement of about 22 thousandths. Now let's change our uh, fixture a little bit. Let's see if we can make this a bit more accurate because some of the problem here is uh, I'm not allowing the displacements to come off of the wall. It's not like this thing is glued to the wall, and, but the way I've fixtured it, it, it behaves as though it's glued to that wall. So what I'd like to do next is uh, let's try something a little more flexible. I'll edit my fixture and I'll use what I call a sliding hinge instead. Okay, so I'll keep it fixed on these holes for now, but what I'll change is the way it interacts with that wall. 
I want it to be free to come off the wall. And really the place where it's going to push on the wall the most, I think, is right down here on these couple of edges. So I basically just want to say on this edge and that edge, the wall, these are, this is where the wall primarily pushes back. So I'll add a uh, reference. Um, and this is using a tool called Use Reference Geometry. There is no sliding hinge in, in Solid Simulation. You have to create this sliding hinge by using some straight edges like I have here. And then with the Use Reference Geometry tool, I'll tell it to not, th these two edges are not allowed to move normal to this face that I've selected. So effectively, th these, these, this edge is able to slide up and down, and even the geometry is able to pivot around that edge, like this edge is sort of an axis, because it is, it is a straight edge. If I run the study this way, let's see what kind of result I get. I'll go right to my displacements. And you see my displacements go up by a little bit. Instead of 22 thousandths, now they're 25 thousandths. And you can see if I really look at this view here, and exaggerate it a bit. If I double click up here on the deformation scale, it sets it to 8. If I double click up here, it takes me right into the exaggeration scale, where I can bump this up to maybe 20. Now you're able to see where that line used to be. If I kind of hover my cursor, it might be a quick way to show you where the, where the edge used to be and where it is now. It's kind of come off of that surface now. Now another way I can view this too, uh, as, far, as far as looking at the displacements in the positive and negative directions, see what regions came off the wall and really where the contact region is and everything. Um, what I can do is make a, I don't want to overwrite this displacement plot. I want to create a new one that shows me just the displacement in the x direction. So I'll make a quick copy of it. If I drag displacement and drop it onto the results folder. Now I can edit this copy and just look at the x displacement. And then also, I wanted to show it to be positive or negative x displacements. So a quick trick I, I use to do that is if I go over here to this chart, you can edit these, this maximum and this minimum. And if I make this just a really small positive number, something like point zero, quadruple zero one, and I make this just a really small negative number, quadruple zero negative, negative one, now you can see where the displacements are positive and where they're negative. And where they're zero is where it's yellow. So you can kind of tell it comes off the wall, it comes off the wall in this entire region right here. Right here is where it, it's held to the wall. It's, getting, it's pushing up against it. And down here, it might push into the wall a little bit too. So uh, an even more accurate way to run this study is instead of using this, uh, this type of uh, uh, hinge, this type of sliding hinge, would be uh, one final way I'll show you, and then I'll summarize all three use foundation bolts. It's another command uh, that, that allows me to bolt things into walls and also a, a, a virtual wall contact I'll show you as well. So the foundation bolt command allows me to bolt this thing down to this uh, plane. I'll key in a uh, torque preload. Now if you're doing just a hand tighten screw it's only going to be a couple of uh, a couple foot pounds so I'm going to do 20 pound inches. I'll repeat this same thing up above as well. Just kind of re 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 uh, do that same one by keeping it visible. And then also, if you ever use the virtual bolt connection, or the virtual, or pardon me, the foundation bolt uh, fixture, I should call it, you also have to do a rigid virtual wall contact. It must be defined along with it. So I'm going to go ahead and get out of this tool. Now you can kind of see that foundation bolt icon. And now, in addition to this, we're going to create a uh, a contact set which allow me to create a virtual wall contact between this face and that same reference plane I used a moment ago. So this this will effectively allow the uh, faces to come off of the surface but that torque preload will kind of keep it pressed up against there a bit. Uh, but it won't allow these these faces to go through the surface. Now I want to also add these additional faces along with the ones I've already selected because they might roll into the surface a bit as well. Now if I run this study, I'll use a coarser mesh because it, it does take a little while to uh, run compared to the last ones. Let's see what kind of result we get on this one. And you can see the expense. The last, two, the last couple studies I ran were instant. I didn't even see the solver window pop up. Now it takes some time now that I've modeled this stuff with a bit more reality to it. Pushing something like uh, half a minute or something. 
So I guess while that's while it's going, I'll take a look at what the final result is in a moment. While it's going, I'll, I'll kind of show you the summary. So here, uh, if I just use that fixed approach, the displacements I got were it underpredicted them. Then when I use the sliding hinge approach, I got bigger displacements. Okay? And if I use the bolt and wall approach, I got pretty close to the same displacements that I did with the sliding hinge approach. Okay, really close, but slightly more stiff. Uh, maybe maybe the bottom of that wall, how it rolls into it, maybe adds to the stiffness a bit. But you can see that that the uh, sacrifice I'm making as far as solve time goes. I know. F uh, 14 or 30 seconds or so. I think I used a coarser mesh on this one. It's not much, but think bigger, bigger picture models. This can be hours. Okay. So that one did get just uh, done running. I can take a quick look at that just to see how that how that pattern looks this time around. You can kind of see the displacements and and so on. Okay, about the same as what I got with the other method. All right, so that's some different fixturing techniques. Let's move on next uh, as far as the loading goes. So tip number four, instead of applying your load, try modeling it instead. So what do I mean by that? Take a look at this uh, fire extinguisher bracket again. You can kind of see the um, where that load's gonna be applied, okay? But also notice how I'm holding it off of the wall. And normally it'll just, it, based on where the center of gravity is, it's gonna tip and, and it's gonna rest on the wall here. So think about how that load, where that load actually is being applied. You know, if it, if it was straight up and down like I'm holding it, that load might be uniformly somewhat distributed on that surface. But if you tip it a bit, if I allow it to tip, where where actually is that load going to be? Might be something like this. So here I've added a bit of a tip. Okay, you can kind of see the little tipping angle, and here's where the load at might actually be located. Okay, this is a motion study that kind of shows that behavior. Uh, now, as, it, as this thing deforms, is that load always going to be at that location? As this thing deforms, you, you might actually have this effect. That load, it, it, it starts over here, but it might actually move its position just, ba just while it's deforming. So you can kind of see as this thing tips down, where you actually start getting an upward angle here as the fire extinguisher slides straight down, the bracket bends relative to it, and it creates this changing angle. Okay. So how do, the, how do we model that? Um, so next what I'll do, I'll just show you a couple of the features of this study. This one takes a little while longer to run, so I'll just kind of preview some of the outlining features of it. Now when I include more components like this, things can get a little more unstable if I don't turn on things like friction to hold things in place and so on. So by cutting the model in half, it reduces the solve time, but it also adds some stability to the models. Okay, so this fire extinguisher won't be flopping all, all, all sorts of directions. It's stuck to the symmetry plane. So here I've got a study that I've already, uh, already set up here. So I've, model, I've also included these bolts in the model. That's not necessary. I guess I could have just used the sliding hinge approach over here the same way I did before. You probably might not see that big of a difference. But I did want to show you some of the contact pressures over here too. So do some direct modeling on both ends. So here I've got a symmetry fixture okay, on all these split faces. That'll keep things pretty well constrained. And also, how am I going to model this thing touching the wall? Well, down here, rather than letting gravity do the work and this thing bouncing around in a static analysis, I'm going to tell this to move to the wall because I know it's good, I know it's going to rest against the wall. I'm prescribing a displacement to this point. Also, up towards the top, I'm also prescribing a displacement here to simulate some of the friction without having to turn on friction. The uh, weight of this, I've tuned it such that um, I've tuned the volume times the density such that it gives me the correct weight which is going to be 9.8 divided by 2 because I've cut the model in half and I've turned on gravity as well. So my load is really coming from gravity and the weight of this structure. It's no longer being done as an external force. And here, if I go ahead and run the study, it takes quite a while to run compared to the other ones. This one takes about six minutes. and uh, But here I get a much more accurate idea of where that force actually ends up at the end of the analysis. And you can see it hasn't the angle hasn't tipped so much that it causes the force to shift to the inside. All that force is, loca is localized right on this little point here. 
Also, while I'm here in this contact pressure plot, this contact pressure plot is just another one of your stress plots, I can look at uh, the contact pressures along some of these edges here. This is where it touched the wall before. This is how I restrain it with using that sliding hinge. All right, so I just wanted to show you that idea. Um, so instead of applying your load, you can model it instead, and we can figure out where exactly that, that force is going to be. And if I ever change the design, make it less stiff, maybe that force will shift to the other position based on that animation we saw. So it kind of depends on how much this bends. If it bends very little, the force is going to be out here. If it bends a lot, that force will shift. So tip number five, I want to talk about connections. Um, so as far as uh, your simulation connections go, my tip number five is to bond first, then add more complex contacts uh, and connections later on. So what we're going to show in this uh, brief little demonstration, I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, automatic bonding, uh, a little bit of a component contact strategy, contact visualization tool using a bolt series, and uh, also troubleshooting whenever when they switch over to a no penetration contacts. Some troubleshooting might be required, so we'll talk a little bit about that. So here I've got this rack. It's supposed to support um, about a one ton of weight on top of here. You might have a bunch of steel beams or billets that's, that needs to rest on top of here for storage. And uh, on the ends of these, this, this is going to be welded to some other structures on these ends. Um, but there's nothing in between supporting it, so we got this thing kind of cantilevered off of here. And I want to make sure that, uh, that these beams are going to hold up. So what we're going to do is um, I'm going to set up a, just a quick and dirty study from, from the beginning and just show you how quick just uh, making a bonded assumption is. Now, SOLIDWORKS simulation by default will convert things like weldments or sheet metal parts. This is a sheet metal part. These are weldments. It'll convert them into a special element type, which is sometimes useful. But in this case, you can kind of see all these special element types in here, the ones that don't look like a solid body. Um, in this case, I want to treat them all as solid to simplify the connection hierarchy. So I'll just select all these bodies and I'll treat them all as solids for this study. I'll use that same material we've been using, this dummy steel. Now for the, uh, as soon as it's done applying that material, it's going through each body and applying it. Now for the fixtures, I'll just fix these end faces. A little trick for you here, if you want to try to grab small faces, you could zoom in really close, I guess. But you can kind of see how I'm struggling. It's hard to grab that face. Well, I've hit the letter X. X as an X-ray on my keyboard turns on the face filter. So I don't have to zoom in as close and see how I can grab these faces pretty easily. Rotate around. It saves me from having to do a lot of zooming in and zooming out. Tap the letter X to turn that back off. Now for my load, I'll keep it simple in this study. We'll just put our load uh, on the top of these two beams. 100 uh, 1,000 pounds per item, or 2,000 pounds total. And uh, just as is, based on how I've constructed this model, I don't have any gaps modeled in anywhere. I see these spacers I got in here, too, to keep these, these things from, crimp, from crimping. If I go ahead and just, just mesh and run this thing as is, I wonder what it'll do. Okay. A lot of my setup was done on the front end when I, just, when I modeled this stuff. I made sure that uh, where I wanted things to get bonded, I made sure that the faces were touching in those regions. So this whole time I've been using a lot of default meshes um, just by hitting the run button. So let's, let's take a look here. Now, if you don't customize your chart, you, you, a lot of times your charts will just show all blue. Um, because your peak stress might be some in some very localized area. What I like to do with these charts is just click on that top number and just get a general sense of how the stress flows through the structure. And this can be very useful for making comparisons. If maybe I want to run another study where I just put a plate back here instead of these two tubes, uh, I can do a quick stress comparison and see maybe, maybe one of them, when I change it from 0 to 30, looks like this. And the other one, when I go 0 to 30, has a bunch of red on it. It's like the average stress is just enormous. That can help guide my design directions very quickly. Now in this case though, I'm going to be comparing to if I just bond everything together like I've just done here versus actually adding bolt connections. Because by default it bonded all this stuff together including these regions where there's touching faces. It's very quick to run. 
but oh, you can kind of see back here it's like it's all welded back there we're, we're, we're in reality there's a bolt that goes through here okay so let's try a more accurate version of this where I actually use bolt connections and see what that looks like so what I'll do let me make a copy of this study call this one bolt 2 I, I suppose I've already got one called bolts and here um, I'm gonna bolt this stuff together using a uh, bolt connection a bolt connector I'll just create one of the uh, one of the bolts to save us a little bit of time here. Okay, but here I'll use a standard counterbore screw that'll give me an opportunity to select a threaded face because uh, inside of here, let me show you what's going on inside here. I've got this spacer that I've got as a tapped hole here, and that's kind of how it clamps into this this structure here through that tapped hole. But I also want to keep all these other faces lined up as well. So we'll do a uh, bolt series keep those other, other other items lined up one two three keeps them all lined up like a pin and we'll key in a torque preload I'm gonna say we snug this up with about uh, 10 foot pounds or 120 pound inches Now I can repeat that process if I turn the push pin it's very quick to create some of the other ones I mean I mentioned I was gonna save some time by not doing it but honestly it's you can kinda of see how quick I can go through and create each of these by using some of these little shortcuts so I can click, and then if I right-click, it knows to go down to the thread, so it changes that to purple. I can select some of these other faces. And finally, uh, this last one, click, and go to my... Oop. See a question while, while I'm doing this. Where can, the, where can we learn more about the refer use reference geometry fixtures? Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Most uh, are... We have we offer some training classes, but uh, also there there may be some YouTube videos on it as well. Um, but uh, definitely in the training class, that's that's one area where we use that use reference geometry fixture a ton. Um, all right, so I'm all done with those four bolt connections. Kind of see what those look like if I turn on my simulation symbols. Okay, see all these little bolt icons in there. But now I don't want to bond anything together anymore. I was, I was doing too much bonding like it was all welded together in there with that initial study. So what we're going to do is I have to create a lot of no penetration or sliding contacts between things. Well, to help speed that up, I know, I'm, I, know I have to create more no penetration contacts than I need to create welded bonded ones. So I might as well change the global contact to no penetration in this study. Okay. Normally this can be a little risky thing to do, but in this study I'm pretty comfortable with my models. And then what I'll do is I'll use component contacts to override that in just these areas. One, two, three, four. Any, any touching faces between these bodies will get bonded together. And one, two, three, four. And now we have a study that's pretty much ready to go. Okay, and I say that pretty much because let's see, let's see what happens. I'll go ahead and click Run. And while this is processing, I want to talk about another idea for a second. So I want to show you another 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 way we could have approached that bonding strategy. The first way we did this, okay, we just bonded t together. We we maybe over bonded it. And we got a result that looked kind of like this. But really, maybe we should, if we're going to stick with the bonded contact and get away from bolt connections, uh, if we're going to try to stick with a bonded contact, maybe we should model it more like this. We add, see, I have add, add little gaps, okay added sort of like a little washer surface because really when you tighten that bolt down it creates a compression mostly where, where that head is located it creates a compression along that seam and uh, the friction can kind of hold it almost like it's bonded in this compression region but everywhere else it should be free to kind of open up slide around a bit and so this region right here I over I overly bonded by me adding this little gap it allows it to uh, slide around a little more realistically and we'll, we'll, we'll compare we're going to see a comparison of how this result behaves versus my current study. Now here though, this is my, my current study I was running just gave me an error. Okay, this is a very common error. Model is unstable. What, what did I forget? Why is it unstable? What's going on here? Well, when I did those no penetration contacts, okay, I didn't key in any friction for them because I knew it saved me time by not using friction, but that means that these guys, these little guys in here, they're able to spin around freely. If there's no friction, they can spin freely, and that causes my model is unstable error. So in order to resolve that, that problem, 
Another little trick here that I like to use is turn on use soft springs to stabilize things. Okay. Um, so if I turn that option on and we rerun the study, it takes, it takes about 5, 10 to 15 minutes to run. So, of course, I won't run it on the fly here, but I'll show you what the end result looks like. So here's the stresses I get with these bolt connections in here. Okay. Same scale is what I use with the bonded. And, you know, it looks kind of similar to me just bonding things together. Let me go back to that slide to summarize. So here on the left, it's a 32-second run with me just bonding things together. On the right is the with bolt connections in there, the way I've modeled them. And you can kind of see the run times much bigger. Okay, and do, is my result much different? Well, yes and no. It's not much different generally. Like if I were just trying to do a design comparisons between this version maybe in the, with a, or another version with a big plate behind here, um, it looks like uh, this, this bonded study might give me some good insights and I might be able to do some quick and dirty comparisons. But if I do need more precise results in this bolted region, you can kind of see that's where the results really do start to differ and also in between where the bolt connections are. That's where things differ a bit because I've overbonded things here. It's made it a little too stiff and some other, so that it's not, this region's not allowed to bend as much. Now, if I use that other technique I mentioned, this one, Here's what, this, here's what the comparison looks like here. It looks a lot better. If I, if I break up that bonded contact a bit better, okay, you can see now these regions here. Okay, they are bending a little more. Okay, it doesn't match exactly, but it's pretty darn close, and you can see the difference in runtime. Think big scale models. You know, maybe this might be the way to go for most of your connections, and you might, you might add the bolt connector only where, only where you need it with an no open penetration contact. Okay, so it's really... Those bolt connections, really it's the no penetration contact that takes the most time to solve. That's where, that's where those run times jump up. I'd like to take some time to show you a couple of things I didn't have time to address in the uh, live recording of this webinar. One of those things was the contact visualization plot. This tool is available in the connections folder. Um, so this study, you'll see uh, I have things both, or I have everything just bonded together in this study. If you, I go ahead and do the calculation here. You can kind of see those bonded regions. And this is that study where I did the little uh, uh, little gaps between things. You can kind of tell just these rings are going to get bonded. And you can, you can compare that. Let me go to some of the other studies. One of the studies that had the uh, bolt connections in there. And you can see what this contact visual visualization plot shows me here. Just gives me a good summary of uh, what I'm actually doing with these contacts. So now you can see the, the regions in red, you can tell the color coding. The regions in red are bonded, the regions in purple here are no penetration. Okay, So it gives you this little legend up here so you know what's going on. Okay, And finally, I guess I'll, I'll go back to the uh, fully bonded study briefly and you can see sort of the overbonding that took place with that original study. This is the study where I didn't add those little gaps between things and you can kind of see how, how big the bonded region is back there. I'm bonding all the way back to here like it's a big weld. Okay. Now another tool I wanted to show you as well um, that uh, again I didn't have much time for. Uh, we In the uh, live recording we did uh, use soft springs to stabilize model. Sometimes this can be uh, a little sloppy way to constrain things. Occasionally I want to be able to control those spring stiffnesses because these springs are very soft and so it can allow even if there is a slight imbalance in the uh, in the load here and this thing's able to pivot it might pivot a lot still and eventually reach a stable point and it can make my result look a bit funny um, so uh, another way I like to stabilize things where I have more control over it is to use elastic supports so let me let me hide some of these bodies to kind of show you what this tool is all about okay so you can see all these spacers in here I can use this elastic support tool. It's right under my fixtures folder here. And I'll just select one face on all these components just to lightly support them. Now I don't want to rigidly fix any of them, so that's that's the idea behind these. And I'll just key in a very small stiffness value for these elastic supports. So it's just enough. These are like sort of a soft spring, but they're a little they're a little heftier than the than the soft springs that were part of that use soft springs to stabilize model. Most importantly, I can, I can control this number. If I run it and I see these things are spinning around a lot, doing some weird stuff, you can come in here and bump these numbers up by some factors just to kind of stabilize a bit further. Now, you go too far and you, you might as well be fixing the thing, and that's that's no good. So 
Uh, but just another control, allow you to stabilize things without over constraining your models. All right, so let's move on from connections, talk a little bit about meshing. Last two tips are on meshing. So tip number six, use, use the curvature-based mesh. Um, so what I want to show you here, okay, I'm going to open up a model. Looks like a simple block. Well, a little more than that, but let me go ahead and show you. If I just try to mesh this thing, just go right to my mesher. Just use the default mesh. Ugh, it fails. What's going on here? Why does it fail on such a maybe a simple piece of geometry? Well, really, let me use the evaluate tool to track down any points of complexity. Maybe my, my geometry is more complex than I thought it was. And one of the tools I use quite a bit, there's a couple tools here, geometry analysis and check. I think I use this one most of the time to try to track down any sources of little, little features. With the check tool, I usually tell it to search for small edges. Find any edges that are a millimeter or less. And it finds a bunch. And it points them out to me if I, if I, oop, where'd that thing go? Must have closed or something. But anyway, if I go ahead and click on a few of these, you can kind of see it points an arrow and, and oh, that's what's going on. That's why it fails to mesh. It fails to mesh this tiny feature that's in here. Everything else is pretty simple. So in order to clean this up, one of the most common ways I use to clean, clean things up, honestly, is just doing things like cutting, doing cut extrudes, or to, uh, Use delete face features. Here I'll show both of those. If I do a mid-plane cut, it just removes that geometry right out of the right out of this entirely, and it won't. It's not really geometry that matters to me anyway. To, for the study that I might be doing. And then I'll uh, delete. I'll use delete face to kind of patch this back up. If I if I use the delete face tool, might want to jot that one down. This is a really handy one. Uh, I can go ahead and tell. Uh, I'll select this face, and I'll tell it to select all the surrounding ones too. It saves me a few button clicks. I'll turn that face off. Okay, grabs all that whole region. I'm gonna delete and patch and see it just wipes that wipes that little region out for me. Now I've got a nice clean surface there. And now of course uh is this gonna be hard to mesh? If I go ahead and create a mesh. Of course not, it'll mesh it, it meshes instantly. Now um the you know why do I say uh, use the curvature based mesh though? Let me show you the same geometry. Okay, the same hard to mesh geometry. If I were just to try to mesh this, okay, because sometimes you, I, I see this a lot, uh, is that users will have little tiny ribs, maybe some small fillets on there, and they just want the thing to mesh and run, and cleaning it up is going to take a long time. Well, sometimes you can get things to mesh as long as you get away from the standard mesher. Okay, this thing, if you want to try to mesh something with a standard mesher, you're going to have to crank that slider way up. Here, I've had to make it you can kind of see the deltas here between the different measures. I had to crank this thing all the way down to 0.4 millimeter to get it to squeeze the elements into there. See how many nodes I got? I got about 1.3k. It's like or one. It's 1.3 million nodes. It takes took about two hours just to mesh the thing. Just that little piece of geometry. Versus if I use the curvature based mesh, 16 seconds. Get off of the standard mesher. Okay. Switch over to curvature based. And which one should you use? Curvature based or blended? Well, it depends. Okay. I personally I use this curvature based quite a bit more than I use blended. Uh, just because when you use blended, it does restrict you a little bit more on the uh, when you're going to apply mesh controls, you'll you'll have to make sure you have a minimum that's smaller than the smallest mesh control. So this one gives you honestly a little more flexibility. This one generally tends to give you a little more quality though. So you're kind of sacrificing a little bit of that flexibility. So I think th this is my default measure. All right, and the last tip for today, tip number seven, plot energy norm error. So tip number seven is to evaluate your mesh quality, plot energy, plot energy norm error. And that was actually one of the things I set up in my default options. And what's nice about this is let me go ahead and I got this little bracket here. Maximum stress is going to pop up here. Let me, uh, let me remove the mesh control off here first. Let me just run this with a default mesh, or better yet, let me run this with a coarse mesh. Just drag this thing all the way to the left. Okay. Just to compare. Okay. Here you can kind of see the stress plot here. It looks it looks kind of choppy. Here's another trick for you. If you want to show your mesh on top of your results, a little shortcut to do that. Right click here, show mesh. Now, um, looks a little spotty. It doesn't look very good. You know, it's like you get this weird, it should look symmetric, but it doesn't. Um, the energy norm error kind of tells me 
things don't look too good there. If I create, if, since I created this energy normal plot in my default options, it pops right up in here. I call it stress for some reason, but you can see I customized it to go from zero to 10. I just always use zero to 10 for my scale. And it gives me a quick sense of where I could use some refinement to try to get better results. So I'll throw some refinement there. Go to apply mesh control. Maybe tighten it up nice and tight. Go ahead and rerun it. Let's see what it looks like now. My stress looks a lot more symmetric, uniform. And my energy norm error is no longer a big red region there. It's still red up there, but I'm not looking at the stress up there anyway. I'm looking down here. So that tells me my, my uh, results should be a lot better here now. And you should still do convergence checking just to make sure. You know, ch change the mesh a couple times and see if your mesh converges. Okay, but this is a great way to just do a quick check on your model. Just change your energy norm error plot. Maybe go to 0, 10, look for those red regions. Um, all right, uh, I can summarize the results as well. One way I, I use a, do like a quick statistical summary, you, you can use this list selected tool. If I want to look at the maximum stress on this face, if I use this list selected tool, grab that face, update, shows me a maximum right in, the, right in here, 64.6 .6 KSI. A lot of times though, I will not rely on this peak number because in FEA, um, you might have one node that spikes for some weird reason, some weird numerical reason. Instead, what I might do is sort this by value and see if I get a pretty consistent number up here. You click this little column, you can sort it. And you might just take the top 10 numbers and average them and make that sort of your, your pseudo peak. Okay, that will give you a more statistically um, uniform result. Okay, so I just want to show you that list selected and looking at some of, the, some of those statistics. All right, this uh, final animation just shows me changing the mesh to different sizes and the energy norm errors associated with that on the left. Big errors when the mesh is coarse, as you can see. Smaller errors are, as I make it finer and finer. And over here, you can see the same thing of the stress. Coarse mesh, as I refine it, looks smoother and smoother. All right, so that's it for our big tips and a lot of little small tips along the way. Uh, so at this point, um, just to summarize uh, some of the training options if you do want to learn more about sour simulation a lot of the fundamentals I, I know I talked about quite a few di different fundamentals here that might help you and uh, hopefully get, get get better results out of the tool as well uh, but uh, we do also offer training classes you go to our goengineer.com website right across the top training and events it has a whole event calendar you can see when the upcoming classes are going to be posted on sour simulation CFD that, that's the flow simulation side on uh, uh, structural analysis and so on uh, so I guess we will just do a little prize question here. Okay. Um, so first one, first person answer, give you a little uh, Amazon gift card. So here's a, here's a question. Other than prescribed displacement, what other external load can behave more like a fixture? And if if you're going engineer employee, you're, you're you you don't qualify for this. Just in case I got any of you guys in here. Hey, Tony, great job, Tony Foster. And the correct answer, of course, was the remote load. So you can see down here in the remote load mass tool that you can uh, set up what's known as prescribed displacements, and you can key in in millimeters, so it behaves more like a fixture. So that's it for today's webinar. Have a good one.